Welcome to week 5 of APH 501. This week we'll dive into the spatial nature of geographic questions. The learning outcomes for this week include that students will evaluate geographically focused questions to be able to discern among spatial concepts and spatial thinking principles, and that students will demonstrate familiarity with online geospatial programs including map mashups, digital atlases, and virtual globes. Some people consider the overarching, all-important question that geography asks to be, why is it like this here? The intent behind this question is to understand the patterns and processes that led to the characteristics of that space and place, its site and situation. This type of question also highlights the traditional mode of geographers to observe and describe features in the present and try to understand the historical events and processes that would have created the current conditions. This simple sentence doesn't really capture the geographical imagination for looking forward to wondering what things might be like in the future. Other types of essential questions, the type often used in an understanding by design instructional design process, might be, what makes places unique and different? How does where I live influence how I live? How do topography, climate, and natural resources affect the way people live and work? Why do people move? In what ways does being adjacent or neighboring affect how countries interact and their history? This is just one small set of many possible essential questions of geography that might be asked by students and teachers. Once one becomes familiar with the skills, practices, and habits of mind of a geographer in spatial thinking, it's possible to modify a conventional non-geographic question to one that highlights the geography behind it. For example, here's a final exam question that could be asked of students in an earth science class. You sampled water from Pine Hill Creek and monitored several indicators of water quality, pH, fecal coliform, BOD, or biochemical oxygen demand over the last year. Discuss how the variables have changed over time and provide a rationale for why you believe this has occurred. And here's that same question posed to students after they've studied the same earth science content but through a geographic lens of mapping and spatial thinking. You've sampled water from Pine Hill Creek and monitored several indicators of water quality pH, fecal coliform, BOD, over the last year. Draw a sketch of the Pine Hill watershed, including the locations of major land uses, plus the flow pattern of ground and surface water. Mark your sampling locations and indicate where, how, and why the water quality indicators varied over the year. Note the practices here, sketching, identifying patterns, observing locations, which version do you think would leave a student with a broader, more holistic understanding of the watershed they were studying? These same kinds of strategies, using spatial thinking skills, practices, and habits of mind, can be used to underlie the content that APHD students encounter. For example, here's a sample question that came from a test several years ago. The existence of Hindu Indian Indian communities in places such as Guyana, Fiji, and South Africa are the result of relocation diffusion, colonial era labor migrations, religious conversions, migrants to high technology development zones, or rural to urban migration. I'll give you five seconds to think about it. You think you know the answer? It's B colonial era labor migrations. Now what type of knowledge and practices would have increased the likelihood that a student would confidently select that answer over the other ones? One idea is to use different types of graphical techniques in your instruction. Tactics that rely on thinking with space support learning. Relocation diffusion, answer A, is an answer choice that students could easily have guessed but relation diffusion means that the cultural ideas of a community have not stayed in the point of origin after migration, and that's certainly not the situation for Hindus in India. So having understood the difference between relocation, 
diffusion and expansion diffusion might have been facilitated for students by having a simple graphic emphasize visually what these differences are. Here's a sample of what that might look like. Or the use of graphics to reflect the passage of time. The word result in the question should trigger the sense of an outcome for students. What do those three places have in common? Fiji, Guyana, South Africa. How could they be linked? They're not all urban or rural places, and they're not high technology development zones, so that also rules out answers D and E anyway. But they were all colonies of the British Empire. Was there extensive spread of Hinduism to widespread corners of the globe during this time? No which is likely to rule out answer C. But what the British were actively engaged in throughout their colonial locations was engineering, creating transportation networks, and mining for, self for natural resources. Those activities required laborers. So, as a result of the British moving Indians to Fiji, Guyana, and South Africa, communities of migrants developed there who brought their, cultural and religion, their culture and religion with them. Thus, B is the answer lay out the local sequences with a flow like this. Use the spatial strategies of grouping and sequencing to help understand the flow of ideas and historical happenings. Sketches aren't the only answer, but they'll help support the logic and deduction reaching of answers. Here's another one. With this diagram of the Latin American city model, indicate which area is the elite residential sector, A, B, C, D, or E. The answer is B. In many such cities, there is a linear spine, often a very wide boulevard, leading out of the central business district, and the elite residential sector became associated with these wide main boulevards. It was part of the law of the Indies that it be designed so. So those are the types of spatial associations that Phil Gerstmeyer indicated are a mode of spatial thinking. Spines coming out of the central business district and these elite residential sectors. Models like that help us understand the simple relationships, but they don't explain what has happened since. What do these cities look like now? How have the spines changed over the decades? Are those still the wealthy sections of the city, and how have the demographics shifted? What do these areas still have in common, and what across them has changed? Finding patterns among those answers will prepare students for understanding the future as well, so they can go beyond why is it like this here. And what do these places look like from the ground? Seeing places from different perspectives is a powerful learning strategy as well, as we practice the mental transformations from 2D to 3D. That was one of those ideas from Reg College, and it's a link back to how STEM practices are effective as well. So these are the questions I'd like to leave you with today. What makes a question geographical? What makes a question spatial? How can a question be phrased so that spatial thinking is inherently invoked in the process of answering it? What spatial strategies can be employed to first understand the question before one attempts to answer it? Feeling confident and competent at creating, deconstructing, and identifying spatial and geographic questions and the patterns within them is what you will practice this week as we explore several different web-based map and data collections. That's all for now.